It's a good crowd. I always love being back in Chicago where our son and his family and our grandchildren live. So whenever I'm invited to Chicago, here I am. <laughs> How old? They just turned seven and five. Wow. Like a five-year-old. Yeah. Maybe they can Our children are much older. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's jump in. The book, 13 Days in September, the dramatic story of the struggle for peace. Of course, it's about the peace talks that happened at Camp David in September of 1978 between the Sadat and Begin, uh, with uh, Jimmy Carter right there in the middle. Uh, and, and I wanted to start with, near the end of the book, you, you talk about how both Begin and Sadat were, were trapped. They, they could not, if they, if they left without a deal, then they sacrifice their relationship with the United States or the fear that the other party will have a better relationship with the United States. Mm -hmm. There's also the matter of saving face, not leaving negotiations after 13 days and not having anything to show for it. But my question is, how did Carter get them there in the beginning if this was something where they would be trapped? Well, I don't think, you know, Begin came without any belief that they were going to resolve anything. You know, he thought they'd be there for a couple of days and they would sort of agree to disagree. And were his were grandchildren in there in, in Maryland, and that's why he wanted the free trip? <laughs> the, the grandchildren play a role in this story. Uh, the, uh, and Sadat really, he felt it was no lose for him because if the Israelis failed to agree to Carter's uh, terms, you know, then, then the, the Egyptians would occupy the space of favored friend in the Middle East that Israel had long Done. So he thought, on balance, he was safe. Of course, they were both so far off base. They had no idea, you know, and nor did Carter, to be honest, that it was going to last for 13 days. That, you know, the, the president of the United States, can you imagine, the disappearing for two weeks, uh, and not just one country, but three, you know, their leaders had, had just gone off into the woods. And, uh, and nobody knows what's going on. Uh, and you know, Carter had the idea, he was very naive about it, but he just had the idea, these are good, honorable men, and let's just get them together. They'll get to know each other. <laughs> They'll like each other. They'll trust each other. After the second day, he couldn't let them be in the same room. They had to separate them physically, and he, you know, shuttled back and forth because they could not stand the sight of each other. Well, you, well, you're right. The uh, initial impetus or the initial idea in Carter's mind was, we get here. We're all wearing shorts and a t-shirt because it's Camp David. We're all casual. Yeah. And I'm going to bring these two guys together. I might even leave the room and just let them talk. They wanted to wear suits. Yeah. They wanted no part of that. And then he initially, he, what his initial plans totally failed, and he had a totally changed tact in how he was able to bring them together. The hardest part for him, uh, after he realized that these guys hated each other and they were irreconcilable, um, and it wasn't just a personal thing. These were, you know, they represented two countries that had been in war, uh, four wars in a single generation in the space of 30 years. I mean, it, just recently there had been a war there. there. It's not like it was yeah, 20 they, years ago. The 73 war had just, uh, had just ended, and so the wounds of that war were still very fresh. And uh, so, you know, Carter realized eventually that he was going to have to come up with an American uh, that these two entities were unable to make peace with each other, but maybe they could make concessions to the United States that they couldn't make to the other party. So he developed um, what he called his one text or single text document, which was a legal pad. Uh, and uh, he would write down, he started off by writing out all the points that needed to be resolved. You know, there were 20 something major points that, uh, you know, principally things like the return of the Sinai, uh, which Israel had occupied in the 1967 war, and uh, the question of settlements, uh, not just in Sinai, but in Golan and elsewhere, the Palestinians, there were just, you know, all the problems that you associate with the Middle East. And uh, so he wrote them all down, and, uh, and broke them down into small subdivisions, and would go talk to Begin, and sometimes not just Begin, but members of the Israeli team, and then to Sadat's main. He really didn't talk to Sadat's team that much because uh, none of the Egyptians 
wanted to make peace, except for Sadat. Sadat didn't talk to his team. Sadat didn't, he, he didn't really, and Begin was the only one on the Israeli team that didn't want to make peace. Everybody else on the team was far more open. So they was, you know, if they had exchanged leaders, you know, they would have been, they would have been unified. But, uh, uh, right, so let's, let's break down each of these guys before we get into the actual yeah. negotiations, which is, Begin was a, a, a terrorist. Yes, he was. Uh, and he has a, a, an interesting and tra traumatic history. Um, he grew up in a little Polish town called Brest, and his first memory was of Polish soldiers flogging a Jew in a public park. And uh, he, when the Nazis invaded Brest in 1941, uh, his mother, Begin's mother, was in the hospital with pneumonia, and the Nazis went through the hospital and murdered the patients in their beds. Uh, his father uh, was, uh, they tied him up and put rocks in his pocket and drowned him in the river Bug. And Begin at that time was uh, hiding in Lithuania, and uh, he uh, was subsequently imprisoned in a gulag in Soviet Russia, but then Stalin released all the Poles to fight the Nazis, so he joined a unit that took him to Palestine. And there he became the head of Irgun, which was a terrorist organization at that time bent on driving the British out of mandated Palestine. Now, just imagine you, the British are fighting the Nazis, and here is a Jewish organization fighting the British, uh, diverting you know, critical military resources away from that effort. It was an incredibly divisive thing that, that Begin was doing, especially in the Jewish community. And, uh, and it, but he was, he was a, an imaginative and resourceful and relentless operator. And he had a way of grabbing the headlines. And he realized uh, early on that, you know, it was British prestige that he was attacking. He couldn't defeat the British militarily, but he could humiliate them to the point that uh, they threw up their hands. And uh, for instance, when the Brits uh, hanged three Irgun terrorists who had been convicted of terrorist crimes, uh, Begin's people hanged uh, three British officers, sergeants, and uh, booby-trapped their bodies. Uh, he blew up the King David Hotel in Jerusalem, which at the time was the most luxurious hotel in the Middle East. And uh, nearly 100 people were killed. Only, only a portion of them were British. It was, uh, but part of the hotel was uh, uh, served as a headquarters for the British mandate. So he wrote, he wrote the playbook for today's terrorists. Yeah, in many ways, uh, terrorism has a, you know, a long and unsuccessful history. But Irgun was an example in modern times of a really successful organization. It drove the British out of, out of uh, Palestine. And then after, uh, after the war ended, uh, Irgun turned his attention to the Palestinians. And there was a little, uh, little village named Deir Yassin right outside of Jerusalem that uh, Irgun terrorists uh, went through uh, threw hand grenades into the windows, massacred survivors, and uh, there were Palestinians who were fleeing uh, Israel before then. But after Deir uh, you know, 700,000 people left. And uh, it, so those, you know, from Begin's perspective, those were tremendous successes. You know, we drove out the British and we drove out the Palestinians. How does this guy? get to be the leader of Israel, the guy who's talking to Jimmy Carter? Well, you know, it's fascinating because, uh, you know, in Israel he was seen as, uh, like uh, David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister, called him a Nazi, a, a little Hitler. Yeah, worked together with him at times. Yeah, on the, on the, on the side they supported him. But, uh, but publicly, uh, Begin was seen as a crank. And he was denounced in, by prominent Jews when he came to America, for instance. Hannah Arendt and, and Einstein both you know, you know, wrote an op-ed for the Times. Smart dude, Einstein. 
they couldn't stand their having the Jewish people represented by him. But then in 1973, Anwar Sadat sent the Egyptian forces across the canal, which the, the Israelis thought could never be done. And uh, it shook the confidence of the country. And uh, Golda Meir was the prime minister, and she had to step down. And in the election, uh, up until Menachem Begin, all the leaders of Israel had been very secular figures. And uh, so he was running against Shimon Peres, one of the great figures of Israel's history. And, uh, and to everybody's astonishment, perhaps even Menachem Begin's, he won. <laughs> and uh, so Peres was asked afterwards, what happened? And he said, well, the Jews beat the Israelis. <laughs> Okay, so then there's Sadat. Yeah. And Sadat, first of all, Sadat doesn't like the British either. No, which is interesting. no he was an assassin. And uh, he, uh, we think of him now as a kind of a noble idealist, but uh, uh, Sadat came from a little village in the Nile Delta called Mit Abakum. And uh, he, I can't tell you how remote from world events that is, but uh, you know, a little mud hut that he grew up in, and uh, he, uh, his, he, his father had several wives, but in, and Sadat's mother was black. Uh, she was the daughter of an emancipated slave, and uh, so he had that dark coloring, which in, even in Egypt, you know, it, there's a stigma. So he was uh, always an outsider. And he, uh, when he was a kid, he was following a bunch of other older boys and they went jumping into an irrigation ditch to go swimming. And he jumped in and he realized, oh, I can't swim. <laughs> and uh, and he, he later said the thought that ran through his mind was, if I die, Egypt will have lost Anwar Sadat. Your know, whole kind of kid thinks like that. <laughs> so, uh, when he was 12 years old, uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi passed through the Suez Canal, and uh, he, he stopped at Port Said, and you know he was besieged by these Egyptian journalists who wrote these glowing articles about how this small brown man uh, with, a, you know, they 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 tallied how much uh, material worth he had on, you know, he had his glasses, his sandals, and his little garment, you know, so maybe one Egyptian pound would have bought his entire uh, material worth. And here he was going to London to negotiate the future of India. This made a tremendous impression on Sadat. And so at 12 years old, he took off his clothes and started wearing an apron. And he built a spindle for himself and went on top of the house he started knitting thread and stuff like that. He wandered around the village with a goat. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, so he was looking, consciously looking for a hero. But he also admired Adolf Hitler. And it, it wasn't that anomalous. A lot of Egyptians who were, you know, at that time Egypt was occupied by the British. And, uh, you know, they felt that, you know, they, that maybe the Nazis were on their side. But uh, he fell in with some Nazi spies, and he joined a uh, what he called his assassination society, murder society. And uh, they were, when he joined it, they were just picking off drunken sailors in the middle of the night in Cairo. But uh, he's turned their attention to trying to kill the prime minister, and they didn't succeed in killing a government minister. And uh, he went to prison uh, for several years. And that's. Uh, my wife, Roberta, and I lived in Cairo when uh, Nasser was a titanic figure before uh, Sadat became president. When he died, uh, Sadat succeeded him. And people thought he was a joke. Um, it was, uh, it, it, he had missed the revolution, for instance. He uh, had been at the movies, <laughs> a, a double feature. But he missed the revolution that you know, he had been planning with Nasser and so on. But then, you know, he became this unbelievably charismatic and unpredictable figure. And when we were living there, there were no diplomatic relations with Egypt. And there were all these Soviets everywhere. 
and uh, and the Egyptians were very cool to them, and Americans were kind of prized because we were so rare and uh, and so friendly. And uh, anyway, Sadat threw them out of the country. You know, the Soviets. The Soviets threw out 15,000 Soviet troops. And uh, it was one of the greatest victories for America in the Cold War. We had nothing to do with it and no way to explain it. Kissinger, Kissinger said, what do they want? And what, they, they, they didn't ask for anything. And he was like, how did we achieve this great victory for no price? <laughs> and uh, then one day in 1977, uh, Sadat was speaking to the <coughs> Egyptian parliament in one of the long-winded Sadat speeches. And then he put his papers down and he said, I would go anywhere, even to the ends of the earth, even to Israel, to, his, to Jerusalem, to speak to their Knesset, if it would save one more Egyptian life. And everybody applauded, and nobody believed it. It wasn't even reported in the Egyptian papers the next day. But 10 days later, his plane is circling over Tel Aviv. And you'd have to understand how uh, galvanizing this was for the Israelis. This was their greatest enemy. And suddenly, unbidden, you know, he's coming to pay a visit. And, uh, but they welcomed him. Why did they welcome him? You would think that, I mean, five years ago, they, they, he, they'd been embarrassed by him. Well, he didn't give them much of a choice. He said he would come. And so Begin and, and Walter Cronkite is the one that stirred it up uh, by calling the Israelis and saying, well, would you invite him? Well, I guess we'd have to. So the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the Israeli National Orchestra didn't know how to play the Egyptian National Anthem, for instance. So they had to listen to Radio Cairo to kind of get a sense of how the tune went. And they weren't even sure if that was really going to be Sadat. It could be a plane load of terrorists. It could be full of bombs. And there were snipers all around Ben Gurion Airport, and uh, and then Sadat gets off the plane, and you know there is, you know, Moshe Dayan and Ezra Weizmann and uh, Ariel Sharon. These are the the most hated enemies in the entire Arab world, and he embraces Golda Meir. What does he say to Sharon? He said, "Next time you cross the canal, I'll have to arrest you." And, uh, <laughs> And Sharon says, no, no, I'm, just, I'm merely the Minister of Agriculture now. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, the question was, what's he going to get for it? Uh, and, uh, and the answer was, he didn't get anything. Uh, he, he went, he spoke to the Knesset, he laid down the terms, uh, which were stern, but, you know, at the same time, here he was, uh, pledging that he will recognize Israel and welcome it into the community that it is, you know, I mean, at the time, the 1977, it was, it, you know, Israel was still, you know, less than 40 years old. And so, um, it was still a brand new nation. And, uh, and yet had been in four wars with, with Egypt. Um, and he said, you know, we welcome. And yet, there was no reciprocation, and that was because of Menachem Begin. His whole political trajectory was about expanding the, the space of safety for Jews. And, uh, you know, there was, a, they captured the West Bank, they captured uh, Sinai and Golan. All of this had made Israel much larger and, in some respects, safer because. Sinai was this historic concourse for invading armies. Why would you give that up for a piece of paper? And that's where we begin at Camp David. You know, they, and, and you, you know, you joke about about Sadat as five-year-olds and Egypt will lose Sadat. But I gotta imagine that at some level Begin felt the same way about himself. And you write at one point that all three, including Carter, really felt that they were examples of the or part of the prophetic tradition. And, and so how much of them getting there, getting on these grounds, which were very serene and everything, started to think, hey, we're gonna make history. We, we are the people that are gonna do something really important, and in some way, even God sent us to do this. I do think that they all felt that way, but then, you know, the question was, we could make history in the wrong way. I think this was especially on Begin's mind, that he could be making a historic mistake. And, um, 
you know, and how ironic the one person of all in the whole country's history that you know it should be on his watch that he would have to surrender all of this land. So much blood had been spilled over, and and, and, and to trust his enemy. I mean, the, what each of these guys had to overcome was themselves in many respects. They, they came into this with uh, blood on their hands, with really troubled histories, and uh, and a deep well of hatred and resentment for the other. And in order to overcome that. Uh, I don't think their religion was an asset. It, it divided them. What about Carter? Well, Carter told me that he felt that uh, God had put him into office in order to bring peace to the Holy Land. And I said, well, you've read the Bible. Why do you think that? <laughs> <laughs> he said, yeah, I had, when I met him uh, in Plains the first time, he had just preached his 555th Sunday school lesson. And... Uh, and he said, well, because we read the New Testament, you know, and, uh, you know, we follow the Prince of Peace, and, you know, so the, the other guys aren't reading from the same document. Um, <laughs> well, you, well, you mentioned at one point that, that Carter had a very big injustice worldview there because they were Old Testament folks. I think that, I think it was a, uh, a trauma for Carter to, to realize, you know, that the, these, the religion that they had in common was also the factor that was so profoundly dividing them. And um, it, you know, religion plays, uh, plays a big role all over the world, but in the Middle East it's an especially profound uh, formula that you know, has kept people at odds with each other. And yet, you know, the interesting thing is that there, the Jews and the Palestinians are simply the same people. You know, uh, you can argue over historical texts and whether the Jews were ever in Israel, ever in Egypt, and so on. But DNA tests show that they're the same people. And uh, the Canaanites. Yes, they're the Canaanites. And I thought, aha! I'm going to tell people this, and this is going to solve <laughs> solve all the problems. You know, they'll say, oh, you know, the Palestinians are Jews. Well, well, you know. Let's have a meal. But you know, the truth is, when I reveal this, uh, they say, "Oh, we yeah, we can do that." <laughs> but here's the thing: you you mention that they hate each other. They do. They hate each other. They can't be in the same room at the same time. And I think this is something that I know as an American, I get wrong. There are moments in in, in the book where you share, I think you call them moments of levity. At one point, they're they're joking about who controls the hashish trade yeah. in Egypt, yeah. and. and these people know each other better than, than their enemies, but that doesn't mean you don't know your enemy. You know your enemy intimately well. Well, there are two ways of knowing. You know, they, 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 have, they come from very similar traditions. You know, and, you know, Freud used to talk about the narcissism of minor differences. And uh, I think that very much at play in the Israeli uh, and, and Arab dispute, you know, because if you are looking at, let's say, you know, Judaism and Islam, they're both very scholarly. They're they're full of you know commentary and you know laws that are even dietary laws that are very similar. If you go you know spend time in Brooklyn, for instance, the you know the Arabs and the Jews live together because they can go to the same grocery stores and the same cafes, and, and the war that they're waging over there it doesn't 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 get fought in Brooklyn. Yeah. Because they, you know, there are people all around them that have made Devon Avenue here in Chicago. Same thing. You know, yeah. They came all this way to live next to each other. <laughs> you could have saved the trip, right? <laughs> but you know, we haven't we haven't talked a lot about Carter, but he he didn't really grow up with any. With a, he grew up with a very unsophisticated knowledge of contemporary Middle East, but he, but the ancient uh, Holy Land was probably more familiar to him mentally than the geography of the United States. I mean, he, he had, you know, memorized much of the Bible as a child, and uh, he, uh, he, the first time he met a, a, an Arab was at the Daytona 500, 
uh, <laughs> when he was governor, and his the only Jew he knew was his uncle Louis Bronstein, who was an insurance salesman in Chicago who could chin himself with one hand, which made a huge impression. <laughs> um, but I mean, that's what the, you know the environment he came from. He really it was when he was 1973 when he was beginning to consider running for president. He was governor of Georgia. Uh, he and Rosalind went to uh, the Holy Land and, uh, and Golden Meir lent them a station wagon and they rode around, you know, all over Israel and the West Bank and, and uh, you know, he took in the fact that uh, there were about 1,500 settlers at the time on the West Bank and he could already see that this was going to pose a big problem. But he and Rosalind went to a synagogue on the West Bank, and there were only two other people present. So, in Carter's you know very religious worldview, that's trouble. And so, when he returns the station wagon to Golda Meir, uh, he tells her, "Well, you know, in the Bible, whenever the Jews turn away from God, they are punished militarily and economically." And she laughed in his face. Even the governor of Georgia is <laughs> telling her how to be a Jew. <laughs> so. It is pretty funny, but then a couple of months later, Anwar Sadat invaded, and she had to step down from office. <laughs> <laughs> and then he becomes president. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, let's let's talk about the negotiations themselves yeah. that happen, because so much of the book, the book is really, as you talked about at the beginning, has three trajectories. You talk about the, the biblical history of the land, you talk about the the events leading up, the wars leading up to 1978, and then you talk about what happens during these 13 days. Was it linear? Did, were the 13 days, was it, okay, on the first day, we've accomplished this. On the second day, we've accomplished a little more. Or was it one step forward, two steps back, et cetera, et cetera? There were minefields all along, and, and um, Carter thought he might be making a little bit of progress, and then something would just blow up in his face. Um, you know, one of the you know big moments. Begin was such an obstructionist, and uh, he uh, and Carter just couldn't did, didn't couldn't figure out a way to to deal with it. And nor could the people in the Israeli delegation who were also frustrated with it. So uh, at one point, Rosalind suggested that they take a break and they go to Gettysburg, which is real near Camp David. So they rode out, and on the way, uh, you know, this is the first time in you know, several days that Sadat and Begin had actually seen each other, because Carter kept them around well as well at bay, and then, and they started trading stories about being in prison, and they, you know, they spent a lot of time in prison, so they had a lot to talk about. <laughs> and, uh, That's what they bonded over. Yeah, they bonded over, uh, you know, all the languages that they learned uh, uh, while they were in prison. And uh, anyway, they got to Gettysburg, and you know a lot of the people in the delegation were military people, and uh, they'd all studied Gettysburg. Uh, Moshe Dayan and you know some of the, the Egyptian officers Sadat had studied, um, and uh, but Begin was not really a military man. He'd been you know the leader of Ergun, and he'd been in this Palestinian unit, but. Uh, uh, he was sort of abstract, and you know, as people were pouring over the cannonades and stuff like that, he was standing off to one side. And then you know, Carter started talking about how you know, this is this is where the president Abraham Lincoln made his famous Gettysburg Address. And suddenly, Begin says, four score and seven years ago, and he repeated the whole address, and and. Rosalind was weeping because she thought maybe he really does understand, you know, the the cost of war. <laughs> well, it progress was made after that. You know, Carter began to scratch off those, you know, on that single tablet that he had. He began to scratch off the, you know, the main differences and formulated what was uh, a two-part. One was the uh, peace between Israel and Egypt, and the other was the prospective peace between Israel and the Palestinians. 
And uh, on the 13th day, uh, they've been up late, late, late the night before finishing everything, and Carter thought it was all done. And uh, so the networks had been alerted that the president was going to interrupt the broadcasting of the Emmys uh, that night. And, uh, Which we would never do today. We'd be like, let the Emmys play. Yeah, they were, <laughs> yeah. And uh, they were, you know, setting up the tables in the East Room in the White House. And um, there, there was a side letter. Uh, treaties like this were often decorated with these we agree to disagree things that have no uh, legal standing. They are simply, you know, we talked about this and this is where we both stand now. And uh, the, the side letter that caught Begin's attention was uh, Carter had signed a letter about Jerusalem saying that uh, it, in, uh, through four American administrations, our view is saying that it is occupied territory. And uh, quoting American UN ambassadors, you know, what they had said. And uh, Begin called him over to his cabin and said, you know, you have to tear this up. I can't, we, we, or we will not sign. And, Begin, and Carter said, no, I had promised to not. He had asked for a letter on Jerusalem. In fact, each of the delegations produced a letter about Jerusalem. And uh, if Jerusalem is such an emotional issue, it's really at the heart of all this. And Begin, I think, I think my personal view is he was terrified. He was on the edge of signing this document in which he was going to give away Sinai and, uh, and, and acknowledge his enemy as a partner in peace. And he thought he might be making a horrible mistake. But anyway, for whatever reason, he blew up. And uh, he said, the signing is off. You know, no, no treaty. And Carter went back to his cabin. And he was the most despondent that he'd ever been. And uh, he uh, had to call Sadat to tell him. Uh, and just as he got back, um, his uh, secretary, Susan Clow, had, uh, Begin had asked for a photograph for his grandchildren. I told you the grandchildren would play a role in that. Uh, of the three men sitting out on the porch of Aspen Lodge uh, talking when they did talk. And uh, so Carter had uh, had his secretary call Israel and get the name of Begin's eight grandchildren. And uh, he had inscribed them. And so, uh, and signed in love, Jimmy Carter. Uh, so, you know, Rosalind gives him the Manila envelope and says, you're going to have to take this to the bank. I never want to see that man again <laughs> in my life. He was, you know, and he was, you can imagine, the talks were not only a failure, they were a fiasco. You know, it was now, you know, at the, the, the last minute, it had blown up in his face. And so he dutifully took the, the photographs over to Begin's cabin. And Begin received him icily. And, uh, you know, hello, Mr. President. And, uh, and you know, I just came to say goodbye. He said, well, goodbye. <laughs> and he said, and I, I you asked these were your grandchildren. And Begin opened it up, and he looked at it, and it was inscribed to his grandson, Michal, and Yonatan. And, up, and he began to weep. And Carter also began to cry. And he said, I had hoped to write, this is where your grandfather and I made peace in the Middle East. And so he went back to his cabin. He called Sadat to tell him the, the talk, the signing was off. And just then the phone rang and they had said he would sign. Yeah. You know, history on such a small, you know, they've been at peace. There hasn't been a single violation of that treaty since it was signed in 1979. But, and true, you're right. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, was, was it ultimately also a failure? Because, as you know, there were two parts of the treaty. Right. There were two parts of the initial aspirations. The issue of the Palestinians, the issue of Egypt. Now, of course, there was no representative from the Palestinian people. 
And that was ultimately, regardless of these separate letters, which ultimately did not have a legal effect, were pushed aside. The Palestinian issue was pushed to another day, and obviously everybody knows that that has not been solved. So do you look at what happened as Carter's great success or, or a failure? That's a mixed thing. I mean, um, if you look at all the efforts to try to make peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians since then, essentially they've been trying to follow the roadmap that is in the second part of the Accords. You know, there's nothing really new. You know, the, the, the peace that was envisioned in that Accord uh, is still the vision. But Carter always felt that Begin lied to him. Sat that last Saturday night, uh, he thought that he had gotten Begin to agree to no more settlements until the Palestinian issue is resolved. And uh, they were building settlements like the next day. And uh, uh, it, he felt betrayed by that. We can wonder, you know, how the Palestinians have, you know, Yasser Arafat was the head of the PLO at the time. And, you know, would they have accepted what was, you know, laid out for them? Uh, it would have been a much better arrangement than what has happened to them for years and years. Had, had the Israelis accepted it, you know, you know, I think that the Middle East would be a very different place now. Um, I think it's a great tragedy that that portion of the Accords has never been enacted. Given the fact that these two very different, two warring men, could come together. It seems inconceivable today that you could have the head of Hezbollah go to Camp David with Netanyahu. It seems inconceivable. Let's even go even further. Somebody from 30 years from now, somebody who had been in ISIS. But are, are those comparable things, or are they totally different things? Is the time different? Is the type of person different? Is diplomacy open to these modern figures, today's figures? Well, we're in a in a place where what you would call non-state actors are playing a, a, a much larger role, especially in the Middle East where states themselves are so incapacitated and they fill a vacuum of power there. Uh, I, talking to Hezbollah is completely conceivable. It's, it's the majority power in Lebanon and, uh, and it's the swing vote in Syria in many ways. So yes, Hezbollah, uh, it would, you know, it would be completely conceivable and reasonable to try to take them into account. Uh, ISIS, I think, is in a different category. Uh, I mean, these things can get sliced pretty thin. Well, that's what I'm saying. Is it in the same category that Begin once had been in? No, I think Begin was a national. And, uh, the, and ISIS is run by uh, apocalyptic visions. And, you know, yes, they are trying to create a state, a caliphate, something unlike any other state. Uh, I'm not sure that state is the right word, but they're no longer just a terrorist group. They're kind of a, a, a proto-state. It is more like a Nazi organization. It's a terror state. And yet, if you have to understand, as a state, they talk about uh, volcanoes. Uh, you know, they create little provinces of, around northeast, North Africa, and and southern, southeastern, uh, southern Asia, and so on. But they they envision that these are volcanic eruptions of ISIS statelets, and that you know that when they think of a state, they think of you know these are outbreaks. And, and they're all related to us and eventually will be consolidated. But the goal is to bring about the end of days. And uh, so they'll never be great administrators of the state. Uh, I, I would always Don't look for them at Camp David anytime soon. I, but, you know, in, implicit in American policy right now is this idea that Everybody except ISIS is acceptable to us. And, uh, you know, David Petraeus, the former head of the CIA, was talking about, you know, trying to peel off uh, some of these groups like al-Nusra. Well, al-Nusra is al-Qaeda. They're 
it, it reports to Al Qaeda. Uh, and uh, yes, it's not ISIS, but um, you know, it, it, do we want to be in business with Al Qaeda? Uh, Jimmy Carter had a very interesting op-ed. Some of you may have seen it the other day in the Times, uh, which I thought was wise uh, in trying. You know, the Russians are working with Assad. And, and with Iran and with Iraq. Uh, and, uh, you know, and we're working with the Turks and with the Saudis, and, you know, this is how we kind of arrange them. But it's going to take all those elements to bring about any kind of enforceable peace in that region because it's so chaotic. And, and uh, as this war is going on, What's really happening that's terribly dangerous is the refugees are spilling out in historic proportions. You know, the Palestinian exodus was 750,000 people. There are 4 million Syrians outside of the country and 11 million in the country that are displaced. And they're joining a, a diaspora that's already in effect from Somalia, Sri Lanka, and Algeria, and Morocco. And, you know, the, the, the world is on its feet right now. And it's going to have profound effects, especially in Europe. And, uh, but, you know, also our allies in the region, you know, there are two million Syrians in Turkey. One out of four people in Lebanon is Syrian. Uh, there's 700,000 in Jordan right now, mostly in camps. This, the, this is, you know, it's gonna be really hard to imagine how the world is going to be reshaped by the desperation of so many people. And to not resolve this problem politically, even if you have to work with people, nations that you don't admire or trust, you know, it's gonna have consequences that we can't imagine. The last one, that's a spot, yeah. I, I, I could talk about this for hours, we're gonna take questions. I do have one last question, sure. and that is, obviously you also wrote Going Clear about Scientology. Uh, I was just reading your kind of history meets memoir, uh, in a New World, which you wrote years ago. Um, talk about it, and you wrote The Looming Tower, and all these books, it seems to be, and they're very, very different, but that, that belief can cloud judgment. Uh, is that a theme that you see running throughout? Well, I have been intrigued by religious belief, and I was kind of a religious teenager. Um, and the, so I understand the, the attraction of belief, and I've also seen how it's done good for people. I've been in prisons where I've seen people that have been transformed by religious faith, and when I'm in these really, some of them really desperate countries, um, who do you see down there helping people? It's not liberals, you know, it's evangelicals. You know, you know people that are, you know, they're, they're taking off from work, and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're down there doing wonderful things. So, um, I, I think, you know, religion can be a powerful force for good. It's just that I've spent an awful lot of time seeing the damage that it's done. And, uh, you know, in large ways, in terms of these kind of geopolitical clashes, and in small ways, uh, in, you know, when you look at people that are brought into organizations like Scientology and built for, you know, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars and made to break away from their families and so on. And all because of belief. Um, the amount of heartache that has been generated by religious beliefs, you know, I don't, I don't tend to tote them up, but it, it is, you know, my takeaway is that religion is powerful and, and dangerous, and, and, and it can be a great force for good, uh, and it can be a, a devastating for evil. Well, let's take some questions. <laughs> right. Thanks. 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 Yeah, so uh, my question is in terms of Scientology. Uh, I had a friend who was a uh, former Scientologist for about seven months. Do you, what do you think is like the future for them in terms of they really did control their secrecy and their religion? 
Well, uh, I do believe their numbers are crashing. They're not, they, they lie about their membership, but um, uh, the total number of Scientologists in the world probably reflected in the number of people that are in the International Association of Scientologists, which is fewer than 50,000. And, you know, the, the survey of religious uh, membership in the U.S. Uh, recently found fewer than 25,000 in the U.S., which is less than half the number who say they're Rastafarians. <laughs> but the, uh, what I am struck by, despite the low present numbers of membership, is how many people have been in Scientology or affected by it. And uh, so the effect of their, uh, you know, their presence in the U.S. has been much broader than their current membership would lead you to believe. They also have about a net worth of about three billion dollars, and out of billion, according to current uh, former members, former executives, that's in cash and offshore accounts. Well, the Catholic Church, as you know, in Chicago, had a hard time coming up with a billion dollars in cash. Um, and they've got a lot of lawyers, I can testify to that. <laughs> I hope I don't have to testify to that. <laughs> so, uh, with money and legal protection, they'll probably be around for a long time. I feel like there's only two ways to affect change in the church, and one is to have the IRS re-examine that tax exemption that they gave to the Church of Scientology in 1993 in the face of 2,400 lawsuits that were launched by the Church of Scientology and members against the IRS and individual agents. Other and countries have not given them tax, or just recently, wasn't Holland or something? Yeah, just Holland just revoked their tax exemption, saying that they're a profit-making enterprise. Um, so that would be one way in which change could be affected. And another is, is some of the uh, celebrities, uh, some of the more notable celebrities who have a lot of influence and are responsible for the recruitment of so many young people, could turn around and demand reform. And uh, I think that that might make a change. But uh, I don't object to what people believe. You know, as I said, I've been fascinated by religion. So many you know, people believe the most amazing things. But uh, it's the human rights abuses that are going on inside the church that I object to, and I think there should be an accounting for you had, you had pointed out that uh, there was no representation um, by the Palestinians at Camp David, and at that time, Arafat would have been the leading figure. Was there discussion by Carter or by others about including him? Politically, it couldn't have been done at the time. Um, and there was, before Camp David, there was talk about uh, doing, a, there was, had been a meeting in Geneva that preceded Carter's presidency, and that he was going to do a Geneva II. And the idea was that they might have Palestinians that are sort of placed in some other Arab delegations, but would not be officially representing Palestine. Uh, but Carter rightfully realized that that was just going to be a talk fest, and uh, you know nothing solid would come out of it. Actually, it was Rosalind Carter who came up with the idea of Camp David. Uh, she's, you know, they were at Camp David one weekend, and he was so depressed about, you know, here God had told him to bring peace in the Middle East, and he wasn't making very much progress. <laughs> and uh, she said, well, just bring them here. You know, get them away from the press, and, you know, get them, you know, a secluded place where they can hash all this out. And so that's where the idea came from. You write that ironically, uh, Carter at one point wanted to get rid of Camp David. Yeah, he was, he sold a presidential yacht. And uh, so, you know, he was on the, you know, and he, you remember, he, some, you're too young to remember, but he used to carry his own suit bags and stuff like that. And so he was the everyman, and the everyman doesn't have a Camp David. So uh, uh, he, uh, you know, he ordered it to be sold, and the military attaché came and said, Sir, you know what's at Camp David? <laughs> Cabins. Well, there's a little more than that. You know, under Camp David, there's this vast, you know, command center. 
And uh, <laughs> when... Uh, Imagine for putting that on the market. Yeah. <laughs> like, on Airbnb. <laughs> and when, uh, you know, when Dick Cheney was at an undisclosed location, that's where he was, because in the event of a nuclear catastrophe, uh, you know, I remember from the Kennedy era that uh, the, I don't know if this has changed, but the, the, uh, it was the uh, members of government and their secretaries that went into the <laughs> <laughs> After that, there were a lot of attractive secretaries that appeared in Washington. So, with your background on this issue, what's your solution to the Palestinian? <laughs> Well, I, uh, I, I, I can't solve it for you, but I can, I can tell you how I see it now. Um, I, I feel like the two-state solution is being foreclosed. And John Kerry had said before he got into this, this is probably the last go-round as far as the U.S. is concerned about trying to accomplish a two-state solution, and it seems that that hasn't been successful. Um, the, uh, and oftentimes, I mean, it seems often inevitably that the failure of a, uh, of a peace process, as we've seen in the past, you have an intifada, which is, I think, was stirring up back to life right now. Um, the Israelis want to have safety, and they see safety involving uh, a line of, you know, a fortified line on the Jordan River. So whatever entity will be left for the Palestinians will be inside the wall that separates them from uh, Israel proper and, uh, and the Jordan River. It's a very narrow, I mean, the spaces we're talking about, Israel and the West Bank, they're incredibly small. Uh, and uh, there are already settlements that are you know, all over the West Bank, and they're being uh, separated with uh, walls that lead, highways that lead directly to those settlements. So I think eventually, if things go in the way that they seem to be headed, that, you know, the West Bank will turn into a series of enclaves like Gaza. And I think that's a dismal outcome. And I think at some point, uh, the Palestinian Authority is going to give up, and uh, and that will leave Israel in the unfortunate spot of having to rule over this occupied territory, and uh, and the the one state that they fear will have be de facto what it is, and this is why people worry about the demographics of the region, because uh, eventually there will be. Uh, an Arab majority, and even within the Jewish population, what you have is this extraordinarily burgeoning, uh, highly orthodox population, uh, with you know families with 10, 15 children, and uh, the that is already having an amazing effect politically inside Israel. So the the combination of you know, disaffected, occupied Palestinians and, you know, highly uh, orthodox, uh, uncompromising settlers and, 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 and like-minded people create a much more volatile environment and one in which I think um, the idea of making peace is even more difficult in the future than it is now, which is why it's so urgent to address these problems right away. A happy answer to you. <laughs> Who are you to get such a question? <laughs> on, the, on the positive side, there will be a book signing. <laughs> 13 days in September, the dramatic story of the struggle for peace. Lawrence Wright.